Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to Kidney Stories. It's your Uncle Jim. How's everyone doing tonight? Listen, I got a special for show for you tonight. I have Mr. Paul Conway uh, on the show, and Miss Erin Kale is, is with him. Uh, Mr. Conway is the chair of policy and global affairs and the immediate past president of the American Association of Kidney Patients, America's oldest and largest independent kidney patient health education and advocacy organization. He's managed uh, kidney disease for 37 years now, including two years on dialysis and I believe 21 years as a kidney transplant recipient. He has a anniversary coming up May the 8th. He is actively involved in multiple patient-centered national health care transformation initiatives aimed at increasing the inclusion of patient preference information, patient reported outcomes, and data across federally administrated and funded programs and evaluation processes. He was recently named as the U.S. Food and Drug Administrator as the chair of the new FDA Patient Engagement and Advocacy Committee for Medical Devices and was selected by the National Institute of Health to serve as a member of the external evaluation panel for the NIH Kidney Precision Medicine Project. He serves as the patient voice editor for the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology and is the recipient of the 2017 President's Medal from the American Society of Nephrology. So big stuff tonight. Um, my teacher, my mentor, my friend, Aaron Kale. Um, I say that because uh, when I was a baby advocate, uh, Aaron was one of the people that uh, was my teacher. Um, I had lots of passion and lots of anger, and Aaron and my good friend Troy Zimmerman uh, helped me to focus that and, and taught me how to speak with legislators, things of that nature. She joined the AAKP in April of 2017 as the Director of Stakeholder Operations for the AAKP's Center for Patient Engagement and Advocacy. Aaron's primary responsibilities include the establishing of a national network of patient ambassadors and encouraging patients and family members to be engaged in various awareness, advocacy, and research opportunities like focus groups, technical evaluation panels, and public testimony before federal agencies. And tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the AAKP's uh, initiative to bring in foreign kidney patients uh, as ambassadors. So uh, my friends, Aaron and Paul, are on the kidney stories tonight. How's everybody doing? Hey, Paul. Hi, Aaron. How, hey, are, how are you? Hi, hey, Jim. Hey, Paul. All right. Hey, Aaron. How are you? Great. Good. Great. Let's, let's, let's get right into it. I'm going to talk to Paul for a little bit first and then, and then to Miss Aaron. And uh, Aaron, if you have something to contribute, uh, you know, be happy to jump in, okay? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. This is, Paul, tell me a, a little bit about your experience as a, a, a kidney patient. Uh, you know, the AAKP talks about um, how it's an organization run by patients for kidney patients and is solely focused on advocacy for kidney patients. So tell us a little bit about your experience. Sure. I'll, I'll go ahead and open up that compartment for you, Jim. I keep things free from pain. Uh, I guess my journey started when I was 15 or 16 years old, really, and uh, it was through a sports physical, uh, a small town on the coast of Maine, and uh, my primary care doctor had done a uh, physical and a uh, blood test and urine test with that, and uh, I was uh, trying out for the uh, wrestling uh, team um, at Belfast High School, and uh, that was detected that I had um, high protein in the urine, and that's really what triggered a whole process of going to doctors a lot when I was in high school. Probably the biggest adjustment for me is uh, my father had served in the military, my grandfather had served in the military, and uh, learning that after all these years of study and preparation in high school to try to go to one of the service academies, that wasn't gonna happen. And that was really my first context for kidney disease is that um, it could create a ceiling and a barrier for you. But fortunately, my father um, and my mother were both very proactive in saying, look, you'll get a curveball every now and then in life, and uh, you got to blow through it. And so I proceeded to do that. I got very active in uh, grassroots politics up in Maine. And uh, my father told me that if you wanted to serve uh, your country, you can do it in more ways than just in a uniform. You can be a public servant. And so through the years, I've been very involved in that. But uh, the journey as a patient 
basically from 16 to age 29, I was in kidney uh, failure, uh, chronic kidney disease. It ended up being full-blown failure when I was 29. And then I went on dialysis and I waited for about two or three years, probably closer to three years for organ transplant. And my big anniversary is on May 8th. Uh, it will be 23 years. I just aged two more years and five minutes, Jim. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Paul, can you tell us what caused your kidneys to fail? Sure. So it took me a long time to get this word right, but it's called a nephritis. I called it gloomy nephritis. It's glomecular nephritis. And they did a lot of studies on this to try to figure out what caused it, but they think that I had actually gotten a strep or staph infection when I was very young, and it had not been completely knocked out, and then it settled into my kidneys, and um, it, it wasn't detected for four or five years, and then it was detected when I was uh, just about 16. Okay. And you were on dialysis for a couple of years, is that right? Yeah, I was. I uh at the time, I was serving as Deputy Secretary of Health in Virginia, so you kind of <laughs> got to learn healthcare up close, you know, <laughs> nothing like diving in. Uh, yeah, that'll um, do it. But I, it was what, very, what kind of modality, Paul? Um, was it I, in center? Were you home? What were you doing? Uh, I was working full time and I wanted to keep working. Um, I just bought a house. And so my doctor told me that as a bridge, as you work to try to get a transplant, one of the most effective therapies is peritoneal dialysis. And because I keep really extensive records and all this stuff, he thought I was enough of a whack job to handle that. So I did a peritoneal dialysis at home and worked um, pretty much full time. Okay. When and where were you transplanted, Paul? I was transplanted at what they call the Miracle College of Virginia. It's the Medical College of Virginia. It's part of Virginia Commonwealth University now. And um, that's in Richmond, Virginia. And I had a really fantastic uh transplant team, Dr. Ann King, and uh, my nephrologist at the time was Dr. Todd Gear, who's now the head of nephrology down there. And uh, they were just absolutely spectacular people. Congratulations on your upcoming uh, anniversary. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, my donor was a 16-year-old um, young man who was killed in a car accident. And um, there's an irony in life, I think, in everything you do. I was 16 when I was diagnosed. He was 16 when he lost his life. Um, and I know we talk about this a lot at our AAKP events, but it's important for anyone that's watching this, that whenever you get a transplant and it's from somebody else who you never knew, um, there's a heavy burden that goes with that every morning when you get up, you have to ask yourself the question, what am I going to do today to serve others? And, um, for me, I take that personally as, as I know, I've never met a transplant patient who doesn't, but, uh, knowing that somebody lost their life at a young age, you always wonder what they're doing, what they would be doing today. So true. Very, very, very true. Um, what is your policy and communications career experience, Paul? Well, I tell you what, it was enough to make my father, who was a Boston Democrat, kind of roll his eyes. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have uh, served under four presidents and three governors. Uh, so I started out in the Reagan administration as a researcher for Secretary of Education William Bennett. And I would do uh, briefings for his briefing book. And that was on issues like education reform, but really more how you involve parents in decision making for their own kids. And uh, from there, I kind of went through a number of different jobs, White House Drug Office. I was the Deputy Secretary of uh, Health in Virginia. Um, and then I later became the Chief of Staff for the U.S. Civil Service and a Chief of Staff at DHS and um, a Chief of Staff for the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Labor for Secretary Elaine Chao. And so uh, had a lot of experience and now I use my knowledge of government to try to leverage that on behalf of patients uh, through work with NIH, CDC, FDA, and CMS. Okay. Um, did I correctly summarize all the national boards that, that you serve on, or did I miss some? No, no. Uh, I think you got them all, Jim. <laughs> you are a very thorough person. <laughs> well, we try, well, we try. You know, it's I, I'm an old trial lawyer, and uh, you know, one of the things I was taught is before you start asking somebody questions, to to do a little research and make sure you educate yourself on, uh, you know, who you're talking to. And, and uh, I, your credentials never fail to amaze me. Just never fail to amaze me. It's, it's well, just an amazing. You can, you can achieve anything with a lot of prednisone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Tell me a, a little bit, how did your career begin with the American Association of Kidney Patients? 
Well, uh, this sounds funny, and um, but I was sitting in uh, waiting for my um, workup on one of the times when I was on dialysis, and I noticed the magazine in the waiting area at the Medical College of Virginia, and I read it, I, and what struck me about it was it was a neat-looking magazine because it was predominantly interviews with patients and what patients were doing. And the impression I had from the magazine was it's all walks of life. And I like that. I like, you know, raw stories about people. And so it was always in the back of my mind. And then when I finished a pretty big set of obligations in 2009, I reached out and said I wanted to do uh, some volunteer work for them. And that turned into a, uh, a board position. And the first meeting I ever went to, I met um, uh, my good friend, Richard Knight. <laughs> so, who is the current president of the American Association of Kidney Patients. Yeah, and we're thick as and, and, and also one of the greatest guys on earth, by the way. So, yep. cool head, my friend Richard. Okay, um, Aaron and Paul, what, what are the benefits to belonging to the American Association of Kidney Patients? I mean, I, I, I'm new to kidney disease. I want to sign up. Uh, how much is it going to cost? You know, I, what do I get out of this? Like, how does that work? I tell you what, let me let Erin kind of lay out um, what it means to be a member, because she has a huge, huge amount of experience in this area of kidney advocacy and kidney organizations. And, and AAKP is distinctive in the sense that um, it's really run by patients. But let me have Erin speak to that. And then I'll give you a personal thought that people can take about AAKP that I think uh, is important. Hey, Paul. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Thanks for having me on here. It's good to see you. How are you? I feel like this is my first uh, social uh, activity in quite some time. So <laughs> apologies if, if it's a little awkward, but I um, haven't seen too many people recently. Um, but yeah, as Paul was saying, um, AAKP is really distinctive in that we're completely patient-centered, patient-led. Um, Paul, he's our, our previous um, immediate past president, Richard Knight, who he spoke about, is our current president. Both of those wonderful individuals have um, had kidney transplants. So everything we do is really driven by the patient voice and what is uh, important to patients. Um, and kidney patients of all stages. So early stage, you know, newly detected, um, diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, all the way through dialysis, in-center, home modalities, transplant. We also have um, family members and caregivers of kidney patients, living kidney donors. Um, so we kind of run the gamut of everybody that has some kind of connection to kidney disease. Membership is free for all patients, all family members, all caregivers. Um, and really joining AAKP is like joining a family. Um, you'll receive support, information, uh, you'll be connected to experts from all walks of life, um, all government agencies that are really working to provide the best uh, patient care for individuals diagnosed with kidney disease. Um, and so um, I'm sure as, as Jim would attest, since he's been involved with kidney advocacy for quite some time, um, AAKP is really a family. Um, we're really a close-knit group. We really care about all of our members. Uh, we keep in touch with everybody. Um, we kind of keep tabs on, on who's doing well, uh, who's gotten a new kidney transplant, who's changing um, dialysis treatment. So we really get to know each other and, and we provide a lot of support and help and um, just knowing that there are other people that have been through similar situations um, you know, that can kind of help you, guide you along the way. And um, so, um, yeah, f uh, membership is free. We encourage everybody to join. Um, there's no obligation. You can sign up to receive our, our electronic newsletters. Uh, we hold um, monthly webinars on different topics. Actually, recently it's been uh, more frequently than just monthly due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but we have uh, a great deal of um, educational resources, both on our website um, and in print. So you can um, ask for a print copy that you could take with you and read at home with your family, or you could take to the dialysis center and read it while you're um, while you're in the chair getting dialyzed. Um, so we really have all the information that you need to really navigate kidney disease. 
We can connect you with researchers that are looking for the patient perspective. Um, like Paul mentioned, we have really great connections with federal agencies and, and other public servants um, who, you know, really just are looking for what it means to live with kidney disease, what the uh, concerns are, what questions you have, um, getting patients and families involved in research and, and everything along the way from diagnosis to treatment to, um, you know, changing treatment options and, and everything. So we're, we're a big family and, and we encourage people to, to get involved with us. Um, if I can add and, one thing on there. And Aaron, how long have you been working with kidney patients now? Uh, so I've been with AAKP for about three years now, a little over three years. Um, but I previously worked with the National Kidney Foundation. So I've been um, working with kidney patients since 2003. So um, quite some time now. And um, it's amazing. It's just, it's been a wonderful ride. And, and I'm so happy with AAKP. And um, like I said, it's a family and, and I, there's no other place that I, I'd want to be right now. Okay. I, I just want to inject something here, uh, Paul and Aaron. Yeah. Um, the backbone of our organization is, is run by some really great people. Uh, Diana Kleins and uh, Valerie and Aaron and Deb, who does our uh, social media stuff. And I mean, Without those people, uh, you know, the things that they do, they all come off perfectly. They come off like clockwork. And the things that they do, it just wouldn't be the – it's the same. Hi, Diana. I see Diana's here. My friend Donna checked in earlier, so I want to say hi. There's, there's Richard, who's the president of the organization. And uh, without, the, without those folks, they really are the, the, the backbone of the, the group. And the, the many, many things that they do, the, the, the newsletters, the webinars, the – the uh, meetings, the, the big patient meeting in September, uh, all, all of that re relies on those folks. And we are so grateful, Ms. Aaron, to have people like you that, that take good care of schmoes like me and make sure we're in the right place at the right time. So thank you so much. <laughs> Paul, tell us, tell us a little bit about um, your experience with the AAKP. How long have you been with them and what are some of the highlights? Sure. So I think I came on board around 2009. And um, at that time, um, you know, literally at my first meeting, I met Richard Knight and uh, it was a big horseshoe table and he sat on one end and I sat on the other side of the horseshoe and we were listening to different things. And Richard has a long history on uh, Capitol Hill and also uh, in business as a business consultant. So he was he was listening to a slide presentation that was rather interesting. I was sitting on the other side of the table coming out of uh, politics and government listening to many slide presentations and at one point we both looked at each other and I knew at that moment without ever having talked to him we were both thinking the same thing which is death by PowerPoint <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're very focused on, on getting things done and uh, we talked during the break and uh, we were two peas in a pod and so I guess over the past 10 years what we've tried to do is um, the, the professional staff that we have, and you just heard it from Aaron, I think one of the distinctives that we have is that uh, our staff doesn't come to work and view it as a job, they view it as a mission. It's their avocation is to better patients. And so when you have a team like that, it's very easy to be you know, crazy patients uh, like myself and the others that are on the board, have a great concept, and then know that professionals can translate that into something and test it and try it. So it's been about 10 years that I've been involved uh, with Richard. I think he's got another year on me. Uh, we've brought in some great folks uh, on the board, but really it's a, it's a staff team that drives it consistently. And the mission is patients. Patients are our mission. It's that simple. And um, that's why it's been interesting and, and a pure pleasure to stay involved over the course of 10 years. It's, it's uh, not something I typically do is uh, stay involved in a particular organization for that long. Um, but this one is much different. It's uh, it's like home. It's fantastic. Well, you know, Paul, just to one other personal uh, antidote, you know, I uh, my first AAKP patient meeting was in Las Vegas. And <laughs> That's I, I remember, <laughs> yeah, in Las Vegas at the Flamingo of all places. And um, 
I, I remember thinking at the time that th there were so many good folks in that organization. And I, I met Richard and I met Paul there. And I, I, I remember in particular that the conversations I had with, with those two men, I, I knew immediately I, I got to belong to this group. These people think like I, I do, you know, they're, they're oriented toward patients and that's all they care about it. And that just, for, you know, as Aaron said, we're, we're like family and, you know, feel very much at home. So just want to thank you for that experience. And it's a continuing thing too. It's, it, it's no joke. I mean, that's the way that th these folks are. And, and uh, very glad to be a part of that. So, okay. Uh, we, we, we talked about when you started and how long you've been there. What are your, your duties as the immediate past president? What are your duties and responsibilities, Paul? Uh, well, sometimes Richard gives me the key, and my job is not to crash the car. <laughs> and, and if I do, Diana Klein cleans us all up. <laughs> Aaron acts like it never happened. So, uh, um, part, part of the reason our board is designed like this is it gives continuity. And so uh, Richard and I had worked very closely many years ago. I think it's 2014 that we started to craft the strategy with the staff. And so now the organization has gotten quite large in terms of its national responsibilities and what services that it provides for patients. So I usually take a sector of different things. If Richard can't do them, we hand things off back and forth. Um, but as past president, I'm there to kind of maintain relationships, um, do whatever I need to do for uh, Diana, the executive director. And, um, and then on the policy side, I kind of keep my hand in the till on what's moving around on Capitol Hill and in the administration. Both Richard and I do. We're a team. Ed Hickey does also out in Los Angeles. But there's such a huge span of responsibility now. It's it's helpful to to be there and just have institutional memory. Very good. Very good. You are also the the chair of policy and global affairs. What are your duties and responsibilities there? Well, on that one, it's um at any given time during the year, if Congress is in session or if in the executive branch, and when I say that, that's the White House and federal agencies, at any given time, there are tr um, kind of like uh, waves and ebbs that go through for uh, intensity. And when that happens, uh, what I try to do is uh, keep a good radar system with our allied organizations like ASN and RPA and the transplant folks of what policy priorities they have, how it matches up with our core principles, patient choice, innovation, protect the relationship with patients and their doctors. And if there is something that we can weigh in on as allies uh, for policy, I'll make different recommendations. Uh, Aaron will run that through the policy committee and then we'll try to be highly responsive. But sometimes this stuff, and we had one just the other day, is just 90 minutes or two hours block of time you have an opportunity to respond. So somebody always has to be on watch. And uh, as chair of policy, that's kind of what we do. Um, and then on the global side, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but uh, last year we launched our first global summit. And literally that's taking a look outside the United States, you know, every country where innovation is, and then trying to insert a patient voice into that decision-making process everywhere in the world. We're very lucky in the United States that we can be involved in our policy process. Other patients are not around the world. They have a much more limited uh, set of access points. Uh, Miss Aaron, talk a little bit about about your duties and responsibility. You have, you have a, a title so long it would take a bus to carry it, but I, I, I'm just wondering what it is that you do. <laughs> um, a little bit of a little bit of everything. Uh, it's kind of the the miscellaneous <laughs> all title, um, but director of stakeholder operations. Really, I I work with um, with all of our stakeholders. So certainly our patients, our family members, living donors but also our industry partners. Um, so Paul mentioned ASN, RPA, so a lot of the, the professional um, kidney uh, associations, um, the other patient organizations like NKF, uh, Nefcure Kidney International, PKD Foundation, IG Nephropathy Foundation. Um, so those organizations, um, I maintain uh, communications with them and, and making sure that, that they're invited to the table and that we share resources. Um, and then also, um, I mentioned industry partners, but our, our uh, federal agency partners as well. So um, the CDC, we have the NIH, um, so this whole alphabet soup 
um, <laughs> a little bit later with our, our webinar updates, but um, NIH, so the National Institutes of Health, um, NIDDK, FDA, CMS, all of those uh, government agencies, they reach out to us for um, the patient perspective, to hear the patient voice, whether it's with a, a survey, a phone interview, um, inviting them to the table at a, um, a meeting, having them speak, share a presentation. Um, so I really coordinate all efforts with, with all of those groups and make sure that, that I connect the, the right patient with, um, with those groups so that they get to hear that voice. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of my job in a nutshell. Yeah, and I used to be a notary public. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's, there's always something new going on. <laughs> Guys, tell me, what are you doing to stay safe from uh, COVID-19? I, I mean, I'm, I'm here in my apartment. I very seldom leave. Every time I do, I shake. I come back, I wash my face, I wash my hands, I go to bed. <laughs> you know, what are you guys doing? Um, I'll give it a shot. Uh, so I've been actually locked into my house pretty much since March 6th. And so I use a lot of uh, delivery services and um, I call all my friends. I have a captive audience. I, I wear other hats. So I've been able to do a lot of research, a lot of catching up and a lot of projects, but extremely cautious uh, because of immunosuppression and um, really try to uh, make certain that uh, I'm not getting infected and adding to a burden in the healthcare system or, or taking an unnecessary risk, but it's quite difficult. And um, But we have had a lot of time, myself, Richard, the staff, everybody to focus on a lot of the uh, uh, education efforts for other patients that are out there. And Aaron, I know that you've been uh, kind of hunkered down <laughs> where you are. <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> Yeah, doing the same, staying in. Um, you know, it's it's been um, it's been a different year <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But um, by now, I probably would have traveled, you know, four or five times at least. Um, you know, for AAQP, attending different meetings and whatnot. And so I've I've been home um, all year so far, and uh, staying in and. Um, Hopefully my dog is still sleeping and he doesn't beg <laughs> he's been going a little stir crazy too. But um, yeah, just staying in, trying to keep safe. If I do venture out, I wear a mask and of course, you know, hand washing and washing everything down when I get back. And um, I think uh, I think I've been a little bit busier than normal. Uh, just due to, to COVID and, and, you know, we're trying to still juggle everything else that we're doing and then having this pandemic thrown at us and we're trying to make sure that our, our members and our patients are, are educated and um, have access to all the, you know, incredible resources. So we've been working pretty hard the last, uh, the last several weeks. Yeah. Now that you mentioned that, Aaron, question for you. What has the AAKP done to help kidney patients learn about COVID-19? What, what are some of the examples that, that you can give us? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so we have a wonderful webpage that our uh, marketing um, and communications manager, Deb Pillai, has put together. Um, and if you go to the aakp.org homepage, there's a big red button at the top that says coronavirus. Um, if you click on that, it brings you to a page that has links to um, credible and reliable resources like CDC, NIH. Um, we have links to all different um, webinars that we've um, that we've put together. So our first webinar was with the uh, Centers for Disease um, Control and Prevention um, several weeks ago. Uh, we recorded it, we've posted it on our website, and um, it's received over 8,000, um, I think it's up to 8,200 8, um, plus views. Um, oh, wow. And that, that webinar was for um, all kidney patients, so early stage all through dialysis and transplant, and of course what family members can do as well. Um, so that was our first webinar. We've had two others, we have another one coming up and then another one will be in May. Um, so we had a webinar primarily for transplant recipients um, and candidates, transplant candidates with the American Society um, 
of Transplant Surgeons and the American Society of Transplantation, so AST and ASTS. Um, and we had um, we have about 2,000 views on that um, on that webinar recording. Um, we just finished a webinar recording with a vascular surgeon and a nephrologist um, and one of our ambassadors, who's a family member um, of a dialysis patient who has um, passed away. But that webinar was on um, on how to take care of your dialysis access during COVID-19, and it showed really great slides and images of, you know, what um, what looks normal, what an infection is, what is a serious infection. Um, and the webinar talked about where to go at this time, you know, to get help. And it was pretty much recommended not to go to an emergency room unless you absolutely have to, because the ER is not the place to be right now with, uh, with COVID-19, especially if you, um, you know, are, are one of the vulnerable populations. So, um, so that webinar has been posted um, on our website as well. Next week, we have a webinar with our uh, chair of um, our medical advisory board, Dr. Stephen Fadum, and he's going to be talking about fighting COVID-19 upstream. And so this will be for those individuals that have early stages of kidney disease and, and what they can do and what they need to know to protect themselves. Excellent. Excellent. And, uh, if I can add in one thing here, Jim. So um, where these webinars actually come from, it's an important thing. So several years ago, um, Richard and I uh, worked with Diana to create two different centers at AAKP, and one of them is the Center for Patient Education and Research. And housed within that is our ability to do uh, flash surveys and, and uh, tracking polls and tracking surveys. So very early on in this process with COVID-19, what we did is we went out and we surveyed patients to find out what their biggest concerns were. And that formulated for us a list of concerns that we could then communicate to CDC. Uh, coming out of my background in government, it's always helpful for federal officials when you can actually go to them with data and say, you folks may be talking to doctors about X and Y, but patients are concerned about A, B, and C. And so we were able to take the data that we had and initiate that first conversation with CDC, have that be the first uh, webinar that we did, and then use the data that we were getting from some of our tracking uh, polls to formulate the other webinars that would be relevant to patients. And so patients are actually driving what the issues are that we're addressing in these webinars. And we're certain that's part of the mix for why we're so successful in getting this out in the number of views. And people are coming, they're watching them. We feel great about it. And you're going to see a whole new uh, set of these coming because it's some of the best patient-driven education with experts that you can get um, and, and the, the share value shows that. Yeah, so, so what I, do we do? I'm sorry, go ahead, Erin. I just jumped in with, with one quick thing. So if you become a, a member of AAKP, um, and again, free membership for, for patients and family members, um, you will get an email um, when these kind of surveys come up. So um, you will be invited to, sh to share your voice, share your opinion, and, and be part of the discussion. And, and the webinars are free too, right, Erin? Correct. Yes, they are. Yep. Shameless plug. So, oh, uh, I know what I, I wanted to mention. Um, I, I wanted to thank Aaron and Diana because we did three webinars last year on pediatric uh, kidney patients, which is a passion of, of mine. And, uh, you know, very fortunate to, to be involved in that. And, and uh, I know those went over well. So, uh, hats off to the AAKP. We advocate for children too. So just thought that, that you should know. Uh, Paul, <laughs> last year the AAKP held its first global summit. Tell us, what is this event all about? Um, why'd you do it? <laughs> well, I tell you what, uh, it has an interesting uh, uh, set of facts at the beginning of it. But um, I have a, a fantastic uh, doctor at George Washington University. Uh, Dr. Dominic Raj, and uh, he's a nephrologist. Uh, he's the head of the department for nephrology and uh, kidney diseases. And I happened to be in the hospital um, with a high fever. I had been treated for acute kidney injury, and I had I had been talking to him because he's such an engaged um, professional uh, for patients. I mean, he's a real advocate. And we were kicking around a couple of different thoughts about. Um, how AAKP could become involved uh, with George Washington University more. And the reason why 
is because Richard Knight and I had been very involved with um, letters to the mayor of Washington, D.C., trying to get their transplant program um, stood up and approved by D.C. city government. And part of the reason why is because they serve a tremendous population that didn't really have access to transplant services over the years. So we, were, we had been helpful, we had a relationship, but we told them that we wanted to be broader in scale and to work with uh, professionals around the world who were patient advocates in favor of innovation. So sitting in a hospital room, me getting better, uh, you know, kind of all messed up, no shave or anything like this, he came in and sat down and talked to me and we kind of hatched out the plan for it. And so it's a partnership with George Washington University School of Medicine and uh, AAKP. And last year uh, we put it on and it was to showcase innovations that are occurring, not just in the United States, but around the world. And to do it from a perspective of why this is so important for patients to be engaged in clinical trial and advocacy, advocacy for reimbursement, and also for younger medical students to see firsthand that there's a symbiotic relationship among doctors and patients when it comes to achieving uh, improvements and uh, extending life uh, through innovation for kidney disease patients. It, we thought it was highly successful. Uh, they made their facilities that are extremely well-known television studio available to us. And uh, Diana and the professional team put a, together a great marketing plan and we live streamed it. We were up in uh, 50 different countries, had a massive viewership and we're about to do it again all um, through virtual and live stream. Okay, Th this is um, an annual thing now, right, Paul? Yeah. I, I mean, it's going yeah, to sure. an annual event. Yeah, we, we hiked up all the expectations last year and called it <laughs> inaugural. <laughs> so in our world at, in politics, it doesn't mean every four years, it meant that we were gonna do it again this year. And so we're proceeding along and doing that, yeah. That's great, that's great. What is it about this event? Why is this event so successful? Um, why, why, why do you think that it, it, it has such appeal? I think because uh, there's a new generation of thinking in medicine that puts the patient at the center, finally. And I think that if you're in industry, if you're in government, or if you're in medicine, especially if you're uh, young in medicine, and you see the human impact and the toll that kidney disease extracts from patients over time, kidney failure and loss of jobs and uh, breakups of relationships and all these different things that impact a person managing chronic disease, you're compelled to want to do something. And I think when you stand up an event that is truly driven by patients and medical professionals that are concerned and invite industry to the table, it's unique. To then open it up to the world, it's highly unique because you can do these things in America very easily. Around the world, it's not that easy. But the patients know instinctively they want to be in the middle of the conversation. And I think that's the spark that hit it, along with an extremely aggressive marketing campaign um, that our staff put together and a word of mouth. And I think that really hit it. I, you know, Paul, I was, I was part of the social media uh, last year in, in D.C., took pictures, did interviews, oh, yeah. that kind of thing. And the thing that struck me about that event, talking to people that were for, from foreign countries, it reminded me of taking comparative politics when you, you major in, in poli sci in college, yeah. because we all have the same issues uh, a, a, across the world and different countries, different places have different ways of resolving those issues. And it's interesting to uh, compare and contrast when you're, you're speaking to those folks and, and uh, just learn so much uh, uh, being there. It was one of the coolest events I've ever been at. Just yeah. really great. Uh, Jim, I mean, the, the practical reality is suffering doesn't know uh, nationality, suffering doesn't know borders, and it's suffering does not know uh, ideology. Um, they can cause greater suffering for certain ideology, but the sense that something can be done and can be achieved and can be achieved uh, through activism and hard application of skills is important. The, the thing that people need to understand is most most patients view themselves as a professional or as a husband or as a wife or as a business owner who happens to have kidney disease. Kidney disease does not define us. But for decades, other people chose to speak for patients because they had uh, the mindset of, I'm going to do something for them, but I don't necessarily need to listen to them. And what would I learn anyway? That's all changed. 
And to see that changing at a global level is absolutely fantastic. Companies love it. And the person that has a great thought or a spark of innovation, they need to know that that exists in the patient population because that's actually what drives human creativity and ingenuity. And so that's another reason why I think this whole thing worked is because patients know that they can be empowered and patients learn from other patients. Um, you will never tell anybody this, but anybody watching this needs to know that uh, Uncle Jim there was the first social media award winner from the American Association of Kidney Patients uh, because he's such a strong advocate. But in terms of technology, he plugs people in and advances is the agenda on social media. And you were spectacular last year. You will be again this year. We know that. Um, but just thank you very much on behalf of everybody that's involved oh, with the Thank AKP. you, Vanessa. Great job. I, I, I will you. never forget getting that phone call uh, from you. You almost knocked me over because I, I, I couldn't believe that there was even such an award to start with. Yeah. And uh, to, to have won, I, I was shocked, genuinely shocked. And uh, just as a shameless Another shameless, yet another shameless plug. Uh, the producer of our show tonight, Steve Belcher, he was a recent uh, award winner and very, very well earned. Hard work, very hard worker on social media. So yep. shameless plug for Steve. <laughs> All right. Miss um, Aaron, that that event, the, the, the Global Summit, that was simulcast. I mean, people could actually watch it live as it was occurring. And people can still access it today on YouTube. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. We still have um, all of our sessions uh, shared on YouTube. Um, if you go to our website, um, go under the, the meetings and events tab and you'll see the global summit and you can pull up um, all the sessions from last year and see the speakers. We had a lot of wonderful panels. Um, we had a lot of uh, patients there like yourself um, that were um, moderators for some of the panels and and we're there in the audience and ask, asking questions. Um, and this year is is going to be um, even bigger. I think we'll have a much broader audience. Um, uh, you know, we reached 50 countries last year. I think this year will will be even more. Um, you know, the word is getting out there. And although our, our name is the American Association of Kidney Patients, um, you know, we're really expanding and, and becoming um, more global and, you know, kidney disease can impact anybody regardless of um, age, nationality, ethnicity. Um, so we really want to make sure that, that people everywhere are connected and, and have access to the resources that we can share. Okay. Um, just just to, to make a point, anybody from any country can now join the AAKP. Is that correct? Yep. That's correct. Yep. And, uh, right. and actually, for the patients that organize other patients in their countries, um, we're working with them. Aaron's working with them because we will actually have a set of international or global ambassadors for the American Association of Kidney Patients. And Aaron can touch on this. But what I was referencing earlier is not every patient around the world has the same access um, to their government. Uh, they don't have the same access to industry. And this is something that we want to get much more involved in. Uh, we've added a capacity uh, under Richard Knight where we have a vendor that we're working with that will actually be able to translate our training materials because we're so intense about the fact that you have to build consumer, patient consumer demand for innovation and put pressure sometimes respectfully, uh, sometimes a little bit louder on government <laughs> to make certain they understand that patients uh, are dying, patients need innovation and that policy and reimbursement needs to line up so that the entrepreneur and the solution can come forward. But this is part of a much longer game uh, that we'll be involved in uh, with partners around the world, uh, both companies and especially patients and caregivers. Excellent, excellent. Um, Aaron, you, you mentioned to us earlier that you're, you're the, the lead on the AAKP ambassador program. Um, can you describe how that works? Yeah, so um, when I was brought on to AAKP, one of my main charges was to establish this national network of uh, really motivated, um, engaged individuals that um, have a connection to kidney disease, whether they themselves are a patient, um, if their family member or loved one is a patient, or if they're a living kidney donor, 
um, to someone they know or, or even um, if they were a, a non-directed uh, anonymous donor. Um, so bringing together these individuals that have that passion and drive to um, not only help themselves, but to help others that are, are coming after them. So the newly diagnosed, um, the individuals that are, are crashing into dialysis and, and don't know that there are, are options out there. Um, you know, the individuals that are, are diagnosed um, at a young age and, and they think, you know, this is, um, you know, this is it for me. I can't, um, I can't achieve all my goals and, and my life aspirations. And so these ambassadors um, really come together and help to educate, provide support. Um, the, and these individuals are all volunteers. They're the ones that we really re reach out to first when um, research opportunities come up or opportunities to engage with FDA or, or Medicare. Um, and um, we bring them to Washington, D.C. several times a year. Um, actually, just this uh, this past, um, or actually earlier this month, um, the 1st of April, instead of going to D.C., we held a, um, a virtual Hill Day with our partner, the American Society of Nephrology, and we had our patients partnering with their nephrology members to um, communicate with, uh, with members of Congress and their staffers uh, via conference call. So talking to them um, about uh, the Living Donor Protection Act, about the immunosuppressive drug coverage, um, and, and other important legislation and, and policy issues, especially relating to this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and they talked with the, the staffer over the phone and they emailed them with all the, the fact sheets and, and additional information. They shared on social media that they were participating in this. They tagged their members of Congress. Um, and so we'll continue to do that throughout the year, these virtual Hill Days, um, while, while we're not able to, to travel in DC for them. Um, so our ambassadors are really involved in, in anything that they want to be involved in. We, we kind of have a whole suite of, of options for them and they can pick and choose what they're, they're most interested in, whether it's research or policy or um, nutrition, veterans issues, pediatric issues, um, all sorts of things. Uh, and so we have over 150 ambassadors around the country. And then just um, recently we've expanded globally and this kind of um, came through our, our Global Innovation Summit last year. Um, but we have six individuals uh, who are global ambassadors now. We've been um, communicating with a lot of individuals in other countries, um, India, Mexico, Cameroon, Turkey, um, Scotland, um, all over uh, the world that are interested, you know, they're active in their own communities, but they have heard about what we're doing and what our ambassadors are doing and they want to find out how they can be connected. Um, so we're excited to, to expand um, globally and um, it's great to hear all these other perspectives and be able to shed some light on, on what we're doing and hopefully that can help, um, you know, and, and translate into to what they're doing in their communities. Karen, this year's summit, the, the, the Global Summit, is going to be a virtual event. That must be very challenging. Can you tell us how this is going to work, what, what your challenges are? Yeah, so I think we're we're still trying to figure all of that out. Um, you know, it's a different time that we're living in now, and um, you know, there's so many uh, platforms and and uh, softwares out there that that can can do this sort of thing. We have a really great um, uh, video production company, Briar Patch Media, who have just been phenomenal with um, with helping with our webinars and um, all the videos that we put out on social media and on YouTube. Um, so we're really engaging a lot of individuals. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes. Um, you know, the professional staff will be busy, but we have some some help with, um, you know, uh, Briar Patch Media and, and other companies that, um, 
you know, we'll be pulling this together, but, um, you know, it's, it, we've, we did it last year, but this year it'll just be, uh, the entire event will be webcast. So it'll be a little bit different, but, um, you know, we're all ready for it. It's all hands on deck and, um, you know, we're testing things out, um, beforehand to make sure everything runs smoothly and have, um, uh, contingency plans in case there is a snafu of some kind. Um, so we're excited about it. Um, you know, this is the start of, of what may be future meetings. You know, there might be a time mm -hmm. where, where we don't want to, uh, to pull people together and have them travel and, and sit in a room with hundreds of others. And um, so, you know, this might be the, the way of the future and we're, we're excited to do it. Um, we're actually um, postponing it for a few weeks. So it'll, um, the global summit will take place in uh, early June. Um, I think we're still finalizing the dates, uh, but it was um, previously scheduled for early May. Um, but with a lot of the healthcare providers that we work with, um, particularly at George Washington University and a lot of the speakers that we have coming in, they're on the front lines right now, um, battling with COVID and, and taking care of patients. So um, we really wanted to make sure that they had that time to, to devote and we didn't want to take them away from, from their priorities. So we've, uh, we're postponing it for a few weeks. Okay. Aaron, you, you mentioned something about a, an initiative for uh, veterans that have kidney disease. And I just, you know, wanted to mention that we are looking out for that group of people as well. And I, I'm handling the social media. Our, our friends, uh, Kent Bressler and Ed, they're, they're actual veterans that are, are, are on our board. They're, they're handling the day-to-day the -day operation on that. So, you know, if you're a, you're a veteran out there and you need help when it comes to your kidneys, contact us. We'll be happy, more than happy to help. Just yeah, if I could mention to make sure uh, that the people are aware of that. Yep. Uh, so that, that, that initiative is headed up. The chair of that is um, the secretary of our board, Ed Hickey, uh, who's a Marine right. Corps veteran. And uh, he has three sons in the military. His brothers were in the military. His father was. And uh, he and I had actually worked together at Homeland Security. Um, and uh, the Office of Personnel Management when we were starting up DHS, actually. And he's been involved for a very long time. He's a former uh, chief of staff on Capitol Hill uh, for somebody that was a World War II veteran, Silvio Conte. And, um, but that effort that you're involved in is giving voice to veterans with kidney disease to be kind of an independent voice that we can work with VA to make certain if patients are having concerns either in the VA system or outside the VA system, they don't feel like they're being heard, that we can raise them respectfully with the appropriate people and get action taken on them. Um, and Ed, uh, in his capacity uh, during the day as a lawyer, is a very well-known um, activist and pro bono service provider for veterans uh, throughout the Los Angeles area. So that's a serious effort that we've had now for uh, three or four years, and uh, you guys have been doing a fantastic job on it. But I want to give a shout out to Ed as the chair of that. Well, well, that's like a grown-up lawyer, Paul. You know, he he does class actions and things like that. <laughs> he doesn't do feather bedders like your uncle Jim did. So, well, um, <laughs> I, I want to ask about about one more thing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I do want to throw in that we will be hosting a webinar for veterans um, about coronavirus. Uh, and we're we're finalizing the details now. Sure. We'll have a speaker from the Veterans Administration, um, and that's looking at we're looking at May, um, which I know is coming up next week. But uh, we're looking at May to have that webinar for veterans. Well, that 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 will be excellent because you know one of the places that has been hit the hardest by the by the virus. I mean, uh, hospitals, nursing homes, and of course, veterans centers. Unfortunately, every night uh, I'm reading that. The, the, the vets in, in those veteran centers are really suffering from, from the virus. So uh, it, it seems like an appropriate time to talk about COVID-19 and, and veterans. Very, very appropriate uh, time. L let, let me plug one more thing before I, uh, I forget. May 1st, we've got this thing called, uh, you know, High Potassium Awareness Day. What, what is yep. A-OK? -OK? <laughs> what, what is going on with that? Yeah. So we're launching a, a national campaign to raise awareness about how potassium impacts kidney patients. So um, May 1st, 5-1, uh, 
Um, everybody should should know after after May first that five one is um, a, a really dangerous level of potassium, um, and that would be called hyperkalemia, and it can have really dangerous effects on on kidneys. Uh, so we're holding a webinar um, May first. That's uh, next Friday on the uh, importance of potassium management in kidney disease. Uh, we have a nurse speaker, we have a dietitian, and we have two um, kidney patients who have um, dealt with high capacity will be sharing their story. One individual has um, early stage, uh, I believe CKD stage three, and then the other individual is a transplant recipient who spent time on dialysis and he also um, uh, was a diabetic. So um, that webinar will be next week and It'll be all about potassium. Um, we'll have some great tips on, um, you know, foods you can eat, what uh, what you should be doing, especially in this time where, you know, you might not have access to, to all the right foods, um, you know, uh, what to eat on a budget, um, you know, everything that you can think of relating to potassium. So um, it'll be a fun day. Everybody will be in their, their green hyperkalemia, uh, okay, 5.1 shirts, um, and you'll see a lot on on our website and social media about it. Great, great, great. Um, one more shameless plug. Um, I did uh, 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 <laughs> I did a podcast today with our our good friend uh, Kent Bressler on uh, his pods, uh, Kent's kidney stories. Uh, we were talking about our kidney anniversaries and, and our, our, our stories related to that. So uh, my anniversary, my fourth anniversary, not, not my, my fourth anniversary is, is Monday, the, the, the 27th. Kent, who, who has uh, 30 plus years as a, a preemptive kidney transplant patient, his is on the 30th. So, you know, make sure you check out Kent's podcast because we're all related to the AAKP and, and uh, uh, you know, it, it was good conversation. I, th I think that you'll enjoy it. Paul, let me, let me talk to you a little bit about some of the things that, that you're into. I understand you're doing some work with medical treatment and devices. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So there are a couple of different things that are going on uh, that are policy issues, but they directly impact uh, uh, patients. So one of the things that both Richard Knight and I are involved in is uh, kidney precision medicine. This is a big initiative out of the National Institutes of Health, the NIDDK. People can go ahead and take a look at it online, but it's a hard science initiative. Um, that's basically tracing out um, the scientific aspects of kidney disease, where it originates from, and trying to help people formulate interventions. It involves um, elective biopsies, tissue analysis, tissue sampling, uh, but that is something that's going to drive a tremendous amount of innovation for uh, biologics uh, in the future, and that's one issue. Uh, another issue that we're dealing with uh, kind of like in a short-term window is trying to get equal treatment and equal reimbursement uh, for patients who suffer from anemia, because right now there is a treatment for anemia, iron deficiency anemia that's paid for by private insurance and by VA insurance. But if you're a Medicare patient, you don't have access to that. And so uh, if you're a Medicare patient, even in the midst of a pandemic uh, with coronavirus, you still have to go and get your IV iron infusions, which I've had those. If you've ever had them, they're highly risky. Uh, you can have a heart I've problem. Yep, right. you can have a liver problem. But we're to, what we're trying to do is fix disparities in how things are reimbursed because at this period of time, that particular issue puts undue burden on um, uh, anemic patients to have to go into a facility uh, in the middle of coronavirus to get iron when actually if you just slightly adjusted uh, to a cheaper basis for Medicare to pay for a pill, you wouldn't put those patients at risk. So we, we run a gamut of different issues. Um, those are medications. We're also working very closely with a number of people on uh, devices. We have a major announcement coming out next week where AKP will be partnering on a uh, medical device that's coming through. Uh, it's quite promising. And um, uh, we'll have that information out there. We've partnered with uh, uh, other entrepreneurs that are out there for artificial implantable uh, kidney technologies. And uh, that is going extremely well. So this is one of those things that when you take a look at AAKP, we literally connect you with the innovation folks, we connect you with the regulatory folks, and we connect you with 
the reimbursement folks at CMS so you can raise your voice and be an advocate for other patients in each of those respective realms. Okay. Um, I got a note from uh, my producer. I have to ask you. Um, he, he, is, he does a show where he's trying to expand his horizons as well. And they're interested in uh, going international. And he's wondering if you'd be willing to come on his show in May and talk about this international kidney group. Uh, only if I can bring Aaron. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a two for one deal, Steve. You get them both. And, so and I'll, I'll, I'll get out an email. Oh, the dog is there. Oh, yeah. I should mention you know, Aaron is a real uh, animal lover, particularly with uh, uh, adoptive pets and, and uh, with adoptive dogs. What's the dog's name, Aaron? Archie. He Archie. Wanted to hear Archie. Archie. <laughs> He's a good looking boy. Yeah. Well, All right. I'm sorry. Archie, Archie's part of the soundtrack of our first uh, yeah. uh, webinar on coronavirus. You can hear him. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> well, that, these, are, these are the things you have to deal with when you, you, you broadcast from home. So I'm, I'm over time, folks. I'm only supposed to chat for an hour and I'm. I'm two minutes over, but I would like to thank Paul and Aaron for, for coming on and talking to us about so many varied issues. And I'd love to have you guys back. I have a thousand more questions. So oh, I'm told, keep going. All right. <laughs> the like to keep going. Hang on here. We talked about medical treatment and devices. How about improved access to treatment, Paul and Aaron? What is the what AKP doing in that regard? Uh, I'll, th I'll throw this out. So our, one of our defining principles, in fact, our baseline principle is this. It's patient choice. And what do we mean by that? We mean simply this. The best treatments for kidney disease are those treatments that align with human aspiration. So if you want to be able to keep your job, you ought to be able to have treatment that allows you to um, do dialysis at home or get a preemptive transplant. And so these are the types of things that we work on, on based on that principle. So there are a lot of different things that are coming down the pike. There are artificial implantable kidneys. There are wearable kidneys. There are new technologies uh, that allow you to dialyze on your own more successfully. Um, there are new technologies that are coming down the line in terms of medications for, uh, to make it easier to stabilize a transplant, uh, to increase uh, your probability of getting a transplant. And so there's a wide range of treatments um, we're in the middle of the intersection of all of those from uh, the design stage to the regulatory stage, the clinical trials, to payment decisions, to going out to market, um, to doing surveys with patients to see what their uh, preferences are, collecting real world evidence. All of this is very complex, but what we have seen is this, just in the short time that Richard Knight and myself have been involved, the interest in producing new devices, new biologics, and new diagnostics has accelerated. Um, not just our organization, but other patient organizations in this space have had a very strategic role in advancing those. So it's a very optimistic time um, on all these fronts. And we encourage folks to, to come on board with AAKP so they can be aware of these things. Because if you're ever sitting there in the middle of a dialysis treatment or trying to figure out where your medicine is, and you're kind of down and just trying to figure out how to manage things, knowing what's on the horizon, how you can help other people makes a huge difference. And it's a very, very optimistic time to be involved uh, right now in kidney medicine. Right. And, and just as, a, as an example that you and I are familiar with, our, our good friend and member of the board of directors, Brian Hess, uh, yes. is, is very, very uh, concerned about uh, artificial kidney and, and that sort of thing, because that, that's his way out, uh, you yes. know, because he can't trans. I, Steve, this is the guy I told you about that's carrying around the five kidneys inside. That's our, our, our friend, Brian. So. Uh, word up to, to Brian. We have political differences, but I still love you, buddy. So, uh, you know, we want, we want this to happen for you. Uh, provider payment. What, what are you doing with re regards to, to making sure our, uh, insur our providers and our, our insurance companies are cooperating together? Uh, what we're trying to do is do this. Uh, so we work extremely closely uh, with medical professionals, uh, the doctor, the social workers, uh, the technicians, and we take a look at issues that involve uh, their reimbursement rates for new procedures or for existing procedures. And sometimes we'll slightly disagree with them, but as good allies, we always try to make certain that the professionals that are involved in direct care for patients are compensated at a fair rate. So that's both from government compensation, but also what insurers will pay. 
And oftentimes we will raise our voice very, very loudly if it looks as though an insurance company will not pay for a certain type of procedure or a, a new uh, type of therapy. Um, because in order to get that instituted and actually have more patients benefit, sometimes you have to throw the door open and make it happen. And usually once one insurance company covers it, another one will go ahead and see to it because it's a competitive market and patients can walk usually if they have the ability to do that with insurance in place of demand. So we've worked very aggressively on that, but also on the flip side of it then, what we've tried to do is reach out to different insurance companies and major pharmaceutical companies to have them understand that we're a very powerful voice for trying to make certain that some of their agenda gets done on Capitol Hill. So if it's a matter of uh, eliminating the barriers to uh, transplant medications. Right now it's capped at 36 months. Everybody knows that our organization is on point in, in union with many other organizations, RPA, ASN, NKF, trying to make certain that we can get that eliminated so that transplant meds are covered for the life of the organ. That is a huge battle. It's been going on for over 15 years. It's absolutely absurd that you get a kidney and it's got an expiration date on it of 36 months if you can't pay for the medications. Um, but those are the types of issues, Jim, that we work on. And, and it's again, it's across the board. Most times we'll agree with people, but if we don't, we disagree respectfully. If they still don't listen to us, then as you know, we have built world-class technologies to raise our voice uh, based on the best cutting edge techniques of political campaigns uh, from both sides of the aisle. We cherry pick technology to make it fit our mission, but we are perfectly capable of raising our voice in a very loud and targeted manner and making people feel it if they're not going our way and they, they don't see the light for what's in the best interest of patients. We are very proud that we've built that capacity over the past four or five years. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I wanted to ask you about uh, provider payment and telehealth, which has become a, a, a big issue. A lot of, a lot of docs now uh, because of the virus are, are willing to talk to you over the net. Um, what people don't realize is some of those visits are covered. Some of those visits are not covered. Medicare covers some Medicare doesn't cover others. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that, Paul. What, what's AAKP's position? I'll, I'll give you a couple of quick minutes on that. So this issue actually goes back three or four different years um, where as technology advanced, for example, home dialysis machines became more sophisticated. They had the component of uh, telecommunications and now video communications on them. But the issue was this. If you're a rural patient and you had a new machine and the doctor or nurse practitioner want to con do a consult with you and adjust your dialysite uh, remotely uh, to prescribe medicine to you, uh, there was a challenge for them being reimbursed for that. So if you think of a rural patient, somebody who's in West Virginia or Maine or out in Iowa, any of the flyover states, so to speak, that person has to drive back and forth for all of their visits. And the barrier to that was having insurance understand and Medicare, CMS, understand that that visit should be reimbursed at the same rate as an office visit. And so several years ago, uh, Richard with his Capitol Hill background, me with my background and a lot of patient activists, including a lot of our ambassadors, we were very organized in unison with NKF and other groups going up to make certain that that could be taken care of with legislation. It was bipartisan, Senator Orrin Hatch uh, was a big player in this. And so we kind of opened the door to telehealth equality for types of visits, certain types of visits. Now, with coronavirus, CMS has basically thrown the doors wide open to telehealth. The question will be this, that's the immediate response to coronavirus to avoid having patients go into different facilities and to reduce the risk of infection. But here's the challenge, and this is vitally important. You have new technologies coming in that will make telehealth much more effective for patients. But what we can't do is we can't let more restrictions now then come in and take away those flexibilities that have been granted. That's going backwards in history. Our job as advocates is to make certain that all those people now who are benefiting from telehealth and all the new young doctors learning these techniques, that it doesn't change and go back to status quo, because that is the future of medicine, is to be able to have uh, that I was very happy to be part of an effort to write a paper on this back uh, three years ago uh, through the Kidney Health Initiative, which I serve on the board of, um, about uh, telemedicine and remote reimbursement. And just if you take a look at the environmental impact of this, of trying to stay green, 
the number of reduced miles in hard weather and bad weather for people, for patients, the number of complications of trying to arrange transportation, you're saving on so much of that. But most importantly, you're actually getting to the point with telehealth where you can have patients more compliant um, and more consistent in their treatment if they know that they can get their doctor and they don't have to travel. It's more real time. And that's really what the goal here is, is it's convenient to the patient. Again, put the patient at the center of the treatment. Technology and telehealth allows you to do that. We're very, very pleased with the waivers that have gone in place over the past month for coronavirus. It builds on what we helped achieve legislatively and what we've written about in medical journals. But we have to keep driving that because on another track is coming artificial implantable technologies like an implantable kidney that could be monitored remotely from anywhere in the United States which would give you greater choice of who cares for you and that type of thing. That Literally, the future is so optimistic, but the key is getting the policy and the payment to align to the patient uh, solution. Talk to us a, a, a little bit, Paul, about the quality of care and measurements projects that you're working on. What, what does that involve? Well, uh, AAKP has a has a great reputation with uh, CMS and CMMI, and that's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Assistance. So what this agent, federal agency does is they impanel uh, technical evaluation panels of patients to take a look at uh, quality measures for dialysis settings, quality measures for bloodstream infections. And what they try to do is capture a patient voice of what is a meaningful measure for a patient, if you were trying to decide between dialysis facility A and dialysis facility B, what information would you want to know? And some of the basic things that measure quality that a quote unquote government quality expert would consider may not even register with the patient. The patient may want to know, um, look, uh, do they have something that's 10 miles from my house? And by the way, what's the mortality rate at that facility? And so what we've been able to do over the past four or five years, again, uh, Richard has chaired several of these and been on them. I've chaired several of them and been on them. A ton of our patients uh, at AKP and in other organizations like NKF have been on these, raising patient concerns and making certain that the patient concern then has a scientific measurement component that's valid and then gets translated into how dialysis facilities or how different procedures are measured for quality by the government. And the power of this is you now have patients determining what a quality measure is, which means that federal dollars then become contingent upon how well a facility or a provider does in giving patients a quality experience, if it's a treatment or if it's a procedure. It, it's very revolutionary in the sense that you are then making the provider not only accountable to the taxpayer for value, but really you're making the provider accountable for the patient consumer's experience. And so that's been a significant policy change. I don't think enough has really been written about it, but it has made providers much more responsive to patient voice and much more cautious about the way they treat national patient advocacy organizations on an equal plane. And although we don't always agree with them, we do feel as though they've come a long way in extending the respect that patients deserve as their customers. Um, and the bill is being paid for by the taxpayer, but the person who sits in the chair is ultimately the customer of that um, caregiver, that provider, and they should have a say in what they think is quality and what they don't think is quality. Excellent. You know, it's Quality is much better than uh, paying people on the basis of how many folks they push through, quantity. Much, much yeah. better. That's that's the point. Um, question to both of you. Uh, do we have any new or future projects that you can tell us about? Um, I used to be a book reviewer, and, and I found out that when I talk to these guys that write books on the New York Times bestseller list, they, they would discuss their book. And then when you ask them, you got anything going in the future? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I've written another new book and it'll be coming out such and such a time. And, uh, you know. I'm, I'm just curious, what, what what kind of future projects do you have that you can tell us about that, you know, are not deep, dark secrets or anything? Well, I, I'll throw one out. There's there's one joke I'll tell you. Uh, our board member, Ed Hickey, likes to say that uh, we were American Association of Kidney Patients, and then we had a global summit. So in two years from now, we'll be intergalactic. 
Um, <laughs> not making any announcement tonight. <laughs> uh, Ed lives on the West Coast, so you have to forgive him. Um, but there is something that uh, we have tested out, and now we're expanding it uh, to a, a very immense degree. Let me put it like that. In 2018, we looked around the terrain, and we tried to take a look at how patient organizations had organized themselves, not just for innovation and to give comments to government, but also to have a larger stake in the political process. And I mean that with a small p, not partisan but in terms of respect and influence with the Congress and with the executive branch. And what, what we understood from history and in watching this very closely and taking a lot of lessons um, to the heroes and heroines of the HIV AIDS movement in the 1980s, what we decided to do was to organize uh, patients as kidney voters. And Richard and I have felt quite strongly about this, that if you have a voice, that's great. Uh, you have a voice and a vote under our constitution and you need to exercise it. So it is a very large voter registration campaign. We tested it out in 2018 and 2019 in six or seven different states. We're full bore right now in all 50 states uh, for 2020. And it's basically this, we are not gonna tell anyone how to vote. That's your privacy, privacy that's your choice and that's your right. What we're saying is, um, to be a patient and to be aware of the issues that are out there and the number of people who are dying, you should exercise your vote and you should ask candidates, where do you stand on these issues? Where do you stand on patient choice? Where do you stand on innovation? And where do you stand as a candidate in knocking down the barriers to get timely treatments to patients with kidney disease? So we're going on this. Um, we've been doing different uh, voter registration events online around certain dates like July 4th, Memorial Day, Labor Day, but we're kicking in the campaign starting in May, going straight through November, and then we'll also be pushing folks to go ahead and turn out to vote. Um, whether that is uh, by absentee ballot or whatever means or as we get to the fall, we'll take a look at that, but we absolutely want everyone to be registered. That's gonna be a huge effort. You're gonna see it all of our social media pages, uh, in our emails and in our magazines, but we are very proud of that. Uh, because we are the only ones in the kidney disease space that are doing any type of uh, identification of patients as kidney voters. That's a big effort that's coming, and uh, it's tested out quite well. Very good, very good. I, 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 can I ask about one more thing? Sure. The cartoons. T tell me about how the social media campaign for the AAKP uh, came about with all of the cartoons. Uh, well, <laughs> it's actually Aaron's dog. Uh, the dog gets up late at night <laughs> and, a thought, and a telepass it over to my house. No, um, it's very creative, yeah. <laughs> uh, I had I had an opportunity in uh, 2012 to um, uh, lead a great organization of millennials uh, that organized to educate millennials on the importance of jobs, opportunity in the economy to their future. Uh, Nonpartisan. Um, and there was a lot of testing that we did in that process, and we took a look at the environment in 2012 at presidential politics level. And really, uh, the folks that had done one of the best jobs on this in the modern era of politics was the Obama campaign in 2008. And it's, it's the use of different mediums and different images and messages, some humorous, some serious, but the blend and the cocktail creates more engagement. And so a lot of the things that you see that we do on social media, uh, they they're there to kind of make you think, make you laugh, uh, sometimes kind of educate you and, and alert you to something that's very frustrating in, here in Washington. But unless people know about it out there, we won't be able to take action. So uh, they're random. Uh, people call up sometimes and they suggest different things. People will be having a conversation with folks and it will trigger one. But uh, it is the height of grassroots playing out. Um, we don't have PR firms. Uh, we don't hire consultants to do this. This is coming from patients 100%. And it's better because it's real uh, and it's meaningful. And so some of them score really well. Some of them are complete bombs. <laughs> need no coffee. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the point of origination. There is a science behind it that we won't get into here. But uh, it, they have very high share rates and uh, we're open to suggestions. Aaron, tell me, tell me what you're doing is that's new. What, what, what new future projects are you working on? I mean, besides the dog. It's all secret. It's confidential. I can't share it with you. <laughs> oh. Oh, my. Oh, my. 
Well, okay. Well, uh, go ahead, Erin. I'm sorry. Grand plans for um, expanding the ambassador initiative. Um, just make bolstering that a little bit. Um, I don't want to share too much because it's still in the early stages, but um, but really uh, pushing that and and pushing individuals to become more engaged, more empowered, more knowledgeable, more ready to take action. Um, so you'll be seeing some uh, some posts and, and announcements coming up about that. Okay, one of, one of the, the the new things that. Um, Diana has me working on uh, with reference to uh, pediatric kidney patients. Uh, are pediatric kidney patients in trials, in uh, in in uh, you know tests? Uh, you know, uh, if you picture this, a, a parent consents to have their child patient uh, test a drug or test a procedure or. Um, uh, have some kind of a, a new diagnostic pro program uh, thrown at them. And I was kind of surprised when she talked to me about this, but I checked it out and there, there really are studies where the, they're written up uh, on a subject. And I talked to um, a number of our mom friends and I talked to a number of adult patients who were pediatric patients. And I was very surprised to find out that many of them had been through this, that, you know, parents had actually given their consent, said, you know, yes, g give the pill or the placebo to, you know, little Johnny and we'll, we'll see what happens. And, and then we're going to write about it. So um, it, 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 it's a project that, that we're working on. And, and for you folks out there listening to the broadcast, if you have some experience with that, either as a patient, a mom, a caretaker, uh, a doc that uh, has written up a study like that, please let us know because uh, we're interested in what you have to say. So uh, kind of interesting stuff to hand off to your Uncle Jim these days, you know. <laughs> so, but but any, I'm all talked out, man. I, I, I know that you guys must be too because we're approaching an hour and 25 minutes. So I just want to say thank you to uh, the great Erin Kale uh, for coming on, sharing her experience, uh, truly showing everybody why she's my teacher, my mentor, and my friend. And, uh, of course, you can't replace conversations with the great Paul Conway. It's just, it's just an amazing, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> what, another one? <laughs> just, just an amazing conversation tonight. And, and uh, I'd like to thank all you guys. I, I, I want to give a shout out to some of the, the folks that uh, have been checking out the broadcast. Our, our friend Candy, uh, our good friend Bobby Reed. I noticed that uh, Martin was on uh, the broadcast tonight too. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for for checking us out and and uh, please please share, pass it around. You'd be amazed how many people see the broadcast afterwards, uh, you know, because of, of you folks uh, sharing them. So, whew, wow, I'm gonna have to eat a steak and lay down. So I will, I will see all of you guys later. Take care and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so, much Thanks, so good to see you. See you. Bye, Paul. Take care. Take care, Mr. Sarah, and take care, Paul. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Diana.